dragon. Is this where the damn drumming and the music kicks in? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody, hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for being here. Welcome to On the Pipe Podcast. I am your host, as always, Tyler Shepherdson. And today is Tuesday, August the 29th, 2023, years after zero. And that means we are just in time for this week's episode of OTP Tuesday. Now, we missed last Tuesday. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We're getting our stuff together. We're back in action. I promise. Racing is back. We had TKO Hard Enduro last weekend. This past weekend, we had the Red Bull Outliers Hard Enduro. We're going to talk about that. And we also had a Mideast Hair Scramble. That was a packed, jam-packed, action-packed, star-studded event that happened up in Boonville, North Carolina. We're going to talk all about that as well. But uh, I'm up to something. Up to something season is in full effect. We got some big news. We're working on it. Uh, it took up part of my day last Tuesday is why we didn't get to it. And then today, been in and out of meetings. But we got some cool stuff coming your way. And I hate to throw teasers out. Someone actually messaged me on Instagram about the teasers. I'm sorry. I apologize. Just is what it is. But we're up to something. And just know, the focus, the dedication, the time, and everything else that goes into making a successful off-road podcast is about to be channeled right here into OTP. We're going to quit slacking, we're going to get on the ball, and we're going to bring you the best heart-pumping, up-to-date off-road racing content that you could ever imagine in your entire life. We're the pioneers of off-road media, and we're going to stay at the pinnacle of off-road media, and I appreciate you guys being here and being along for the ride. It means the world to me. Can't wait. Uh, you guys are the best, and I'm going to quit rambling about it. I feel like these kind of, these ramble conversations happen every so often, but uh, yeah, we're going to jump right into it. We're going to jump into what is going on in the world of off-road racing. Once again, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being a fan of Beta Motorcycles, who are the official manufacturers of On The Pipe Podcast. As you guys all know, they've been family-owned and operated since 1905. They manufacture the finest enduro trials and dual-sport motorcycles. The 24 two-strokes are hitting dealerships as we speak, and they couldn't be any sicker, and they couldn't have any more rideability than they already have. Head over to BetaUSA.com for more information about their available models and to find a dealer near you to get yours today because they are hitting the lot. You can put your butt cheeks on a Beta motorcycle, a 2024 Beta motorcycle. They're the only dirt bikes with a warranty. They're the only dirt bikes you can order your parts, your suspension, whatever you want, already on it. And that's how it shows up. You don't have to worry about buying that stuff and putting it on afterwards. You can order your Beta motorcycle with that stuff already on it. And what other dirt bike do you know with a warranty? I'm just saying. Uh, so try out a Beta motorcycle. You're going to love them. I love mine. We got some stuff coming up planned with Beta as well. We spent all last weekend with the Beta Boys and Johnny Walker. That was down here to race the TKO Enduro and race the Outliers, so that was cool. We're going to get a little bit of that as well. Uh, right after I let you know about Zach Tussle, who is a financial advisor and a racer, and he works for Raymond James Financial. They're a big old conglomerate. Uh, but Zach, he's young, he's hungry, he's a racer. He understands you, he understands me, he understands this industry. He'll be on a starting line right next to you, and he'll be the best person that could possibly manage your money going forward and help you with a smart financial plan. He helps a lot of the racers. He helps uh, me in this podcast. He helps a lot of people that you probably know, and it's t the time is now. You see the economy. You see the way the world is working. Um, I don't know all the ins and outs about stocks. I know a little bit. I don't know if you know all the ins and outs about stocks, but that's why I take money give it to Zach Tussle and he knows everything about stocks and trends and markets and what's going on and uh he'll be more than happy to help you out manage your money like I said before you don't have to be rich um you just have to 
want to invest and save for the future. That's all. That's it. That's the only requirement. You can make minimum wage and still have enough money for a financial advisor. So it's not something that you have to have a bunch of money already. Um, but I can't explain it better than Zach can. So find Zach, financial advisors, denvernc.com, or search him on the interwebs, the social medias, Zach Tussle. Let him know you listen to OTP. You'll get a free consultation. He'll tell you all about it, exactly what he can do and how he can help. Now, last weekend, I should have done it with a fresher on my brain. We were at the Tennessee Knockout, the TKO Enduro. Last year, if you listen to my episode, my podcast from last year, it was a mind-boggling experience. It was so cool. It was my first time ever being at TKO. Last year, it was a Wes event, which is the World Enduro Super Series. And I swear, last year you would walk through the woods and it would take you a while to overhear a conversation in English. Because everyone, dude, people were here from uh, all over Europe, all over South America, all over Mexico, um, Canada. It's so crazy the level of representation that these fans have and that these riders have. Going to that event is an unreal experience. If you've never been to one of these like major hard enduro events like the TKO um, or pretty much any West event or even Red Bull hard enduros, you have to go. It is unlike anything else, especially so like GNCCs. I'm pretty proficient with my GNCC knowledge. I know the guys, all the guys on the front row, all the guys on the second row, all the guys on the third row, most of the guys on every other row after that, all the girls on the WXC row. I go to these hard enduros, man, and I am I'm I'm a lot more in tune with it now. But I will admit, when I went to Battle of the Goats, Battle of the Goats was the first hard enduro I ever went to. I raced it on a 1998 KDX 220. It was sick. Uh, it was very hot. It was Battle of the Goats up here at Brushy Mountain in North Carolina. That was the first hard enduro event I went to. Ryan Sipes raced that one that, that year, and Jordan Ashburn raced it. Because that was the one, uh, it was one of the full, it was the full gas in Pennsylvania. We all went to dinner. Uh, Jordan and Mary Ashburn came out to dinner with us, and he sat next to me, and I was like, hey, you going to Battle of the Goats? He's like, oh, when is it? And I told him, and there's nothing else going on. So he came up uh, on a whim, like didn't know he was racing it until like a week or two beforehand, I think this was. And he shows up and wins the dang thing. Um, so Jordan Ashburn and Ryan Sipes were like the only riders I knew. <laughs> and it was such an unreal experience. And that actually turned out to be a pretty funny experience because on my KDX, we started off in um, in the – it's like an enduro cross section up top. And – I was on the KDX, and so they have, like, all the man-made obstacles, the logs, the rocks, the tires, the tractor tires, all that kind of stuff. So I thought I think I started on row four. I was in the first race of the day. Uh, I was a B rider, and I was up towards the front because it was B and C and vet riders, I think, in this one. So I was like, man, someone's going to get stuck on these first couple rows, and it's going to screw up everybody. Well, turns out nobody on the four rows in front of me got stuck, but when I came around to the tractor tires, the front fork lugs on that KDX stick so far down past the axle. So a guy fell over right in front of me going up like this step-up tiered tractor tires thing, and so I had to stop, and then I had to try to get going from already on top of it, and when I did it, my front wheel like dived down in between the tractor tires, and those lugs, because they stick so far down, got stuck into the tire, into the tractor. So I'm literally, I'm on a KDX 220, and I'm in a Hawaiian shirt, and I'm the squid that is holding up the entire race. Because rows take off, I think it was like every 10 seconds, 15 seconds, and it was five at a time. So the next thing I know, dude, there's a crowd piling up behind me. There's people all over the place. Um... And I'm sitting here stuck with a KDX in a Hawaiian shirt that I cannot move and that I cannot get going. <laughs> and, uh, I'm just sitting there looking like an idiot. Well, I look up and I see this fella. He's wearing a Red Bull KTM shirt. Or no, he's just wearing a KTM shirt. And he's he's like recording me, like standing right like five feet away from me recording me. And uh, has his phone out. And I didn't know who he was. Um, and I like said something to his camera. I was like, man, this sucks. Well, I ended up having to, like, kick the bike sideways. Like, I couldn't lift it up, so I just had to kick it sideways till it fell over and then pull it up and over. Anyway, it turned into a big ordeal. After the race, uh, when I got back to service, my phone starts blowing up, and I look, and there's a live video posted from one of the best guys in the world. It was Tristan Hart. 
that was standing there recording that thing. So Tristan Hart has been on a tear lately. He's been winning almost everything he goes to. Um, he was the one recording me on live as I'm the biggest goober in a Hawaiian shirt on a KDX 220 holding up an entire race and causing a bottleneck off of the start, which is also coincidentally right where every single fan in the tennis is just sitting there watching. So that was good times. Uh, that was my first Hart Enduro story. But long story long, what I was getting at is that when I went to that, Hard Enduro. I didn't know anybody, dude. I didn't even know Tristan Hart, who was like the guy. And um, I think that was the the year before he signed with Factory KTM. I think he was on a RPM KTM, if I'm remembering correctly. I think this was like 2018 or 2019. Um, but anyway, so it was nuts. I knew Ryan Sipes and I knew Jordan Ashburn, and that was it. So what I'm getting at is... For me, and for I'm sure a lot of you, we go to the local hair scrambles, we go to the National Enduros, we go to the GNCCs, we go to all this stuff around here. When you go to a hard enduro, it's a completely different crowd. You think off-road is off-road? No, it's completely different. Not only from the pro class, but all the amateur classes. Like A lot of them guys don't race anything but hard enduros. And it's so cool. It's such like a culture shock almost, especially as involved as I've been in racing, like working for Full Gas, working for GNCC, doing the podcast, working for middies, doing all this stuff. And then, like, you see the same people, you see the same stuff, which I love. But then I go to that hardened Duro and, like, just felt like a fish out of water, like completely out of place, not recognizing anybody. And I kind of got the the bug bit on me then. So then I started following it more and more. Um, but then going to a few more of them and then going to TKO last year, was a complete and utter culture shock, man. I've never seen that many people from that many places. Even at a GNCC, like, I can't tell you how often I'll go to a GNCC and I'll be standing there and the leaders will come around. It'll be, let's say, Ben Kelly out front, Josh Strang in second, Stu Baylor in third. Like, people will come by and I'll be sitting there filming, like, standing somewhere on the track filming, and I'll hear people in the crowd say, who is that? Who is that? Which, which one is that guy? Or do you know who that is? Especially when you start getting to, like, XC2 riders, like, who is that? What guy is that? And these are people that are at GNCCs, and, like, it blows my mind. Like, how do you not know who that is? You go to a hard enduro, especially one of these major events. Now, I haven't been to, like, many, like, local hard enduros, but you go to these major hard enduros, I'm talking about six-year-olds up to 76-year-olds are standing on the side of the track, and every single person that comes by – Oh, that's Manny Lettenbickler. He's from so and so and where and where. Oh, that's uh, Texas Tim. He's riding from Beta. He's here from Germany. He raced this and he raced that. Oh, here comes uh, here comes the the GNCC guy. That's Jordan Ashburn. So it's crazy how in tune all the fans. One, it's crazy how many fans there are. Two, it's crazy how in tune they are. They know everything. The fans of Hard Enduro know everything about Hard Enduro. You don't see. The casual fan. You don't see the guy that doesn't know like everybody on the track. And I, I think that's one of the things that stands out to me the most. And the fact that there is so many foreign people there. Like you'll go through, you'll hear people speaking Dutch. You'll hear people speaking Spanish. You'll hear people speaking Portuguese. It's the craziest thing in the world, man, to see how big of fans of Hard Enduro these guys are. Uh, it makes me want to go over to Europe and go to one of these things so bad. I want to go to a, a Hard Enduro in Europe. I want to go to like a World Enduro Super Series event in Europe or anywhere, South America, wherever it is. It's just crazy. It's a really cool experience. If you haven't been to one, I would highly suggest going to one. Um, speaking of the people like talking about people going by, one of the craziest things, last year you heard all about every time Jordan came around because they did the straight rhythm in downtown Nashville, which was a spectacle all in itself. I wish they did that again. But Jordan would come around you hear everybody say, oh, that's the GNCC guy. That's Jordan Ashburn, the GNCC guy. And the biggest difference, one of the big differences I noticed this year is every time he would come around, it was, that's the XC1 champion GNCC guy. That's the GNCC champion Jordan Ashburn. Oh, here comes the the overall champion GNC, or GNCC guy. And so, I don't know, I thought that was pretty neat. I was talking to, to Jordan and Mary about that at the race. It was just, uh, it just stood out to me as one of those things that's different. Um, especially what a year and a championship can make. Um, so I don't know. It was cool going from that GNCC guy to the GNCC champion and still going out there and competing. Like Jordan is a competitor out there. The, the elimination rate, like the, 
the prologue where or it's not the prologue, but TKO one, they go single file, and then they take those times and stage you for TKO two, where you take off in groups of six, and then you just have to beat two people on your row. So they take the top four out of six riders per row, and you start every five minutes. And um, Jordan got second place in single in TKO one, and then I think he got like second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, somewhere really high overall on the the TKO two as well. Like Jordan. He's not there just riding around. Like he can compete. Like I said, he won Battle of Goats against some of the best. And then um he's always done really good at, at TKO as well. It was a bummer this year. In the first turn, basically, I think it might have technically been the second turn, but the first obstacle that you get to, there was a giant pile up starting the the main event, the main like elimination thing for TKO. And Jordan got wrapped up right in the middle of it. He was in the back of it. I have it on video if you watch the YouTube video. Um, right at the start of the main race, someone like takes him out, squeezes him inside, and then like two bikes fall on top of him. So not only did he go down, but then he's stuck, can't get his bike out. And meanwhile, all the guys are off in the woods except for like the two or three guys that got caught up in this thing. And Jordan was dead last, which is an absolute bummer because, like I said, he had been so competitive all weekend. Even last year in the Dominican Republic for Terra Inferno, when Travis Pastrana and Ryan Sites put on that race. Jordan was in the mix. Jordan was in it for the overall win. The only reason, I, I mean, he could have won that thing, but on the first day, they were all riding borrowed bikes. His bike blew up like a mile into the race, and so he had to get another one to finish the that race on. But then he won one of the races on the second day and then got third place at the, the night race before, and then he won one of the beach motos on the final day there. And this is against Tristan Hart. Manny Letton Bickler was there. Um, it was a lot of those those top guys, and top guys from all sorts of um, disciplines. Logan Sapala, like 187-time hill climb national champion. He was there. Austin Tyler, hill climb champion, was there. Uh, Josh Toth was there. And and Jordan was competing and, and winning against those guys. And... Um, yeah, I, what I'm getting at is that I think he could have been in the mix. He rode a good race after that, but uh, starting dead last and something like that, it does kind of take a toll because that last race, it's a very short course. Like I think they're doing five or six minute lap times and they do a 35 minute moto. So it's like basically all the gnarly technical stuff in one loop. So instead of running the outer loop between them all, you do one gnarly thing and get to the next gnarly thing as quick as possible and then do that gnarly thing and then get to the next gnarly thing as quick as possible. And that that's the final loop. Um, but it was cool to see. It was cool to be there. I suggest that you get to one of these hardened duros. Um, speaking of Logan Sapala, saw him while he was out there. He was racing TKO. Uh, he had an absolutely great showing as well. Uh, he was in the last chance qualifier to to get in to the last knockout, and he won that thing. It was another straight rhythm event. Um, so, yeah, it was cool being able to see him again, talk to him. Uh, super cool dude. I got to go check out one of these hill climbs. Uh him, like I said, Logan and then Austin Tyler. I met both of those guys. Super cool guys. And I've never, just like I was talking about, not knowing anything about Hardendo, I know even less about Hill Climb, but I met those dudes, and they're super cool, and it makes me want to go check it out. The videos of them look gnarly. Um, so that's the, the next thing on the list. Hopefully we can get to one of those coming up. He told me about a few of the big events that are coming up uh, this year, so – be on the lookout because we're going to get some footage. We're going to get some content. We're going to be at at least one of those big hill climbs. Um, trying to work it out as to which one, though. So, that was it, man. TKO. Every other year, from what I heard, is going to be a West event. So, last year was a West event. This year wasn't. Next year will be. Which is weird because last year with the West event, there was more fans, but there was less of the top riders. And I know injuries played into that and what have you, but this year... There was a lot of top riders and not quite as many fans. Still a lot of fans, but not quite as many fans. But, um, no, it was a super cool race. Um, I had a blast being there. If you haven't already, I filmed the entire thing. It is on the OTP YouTube channel. 
So if you go to uh, YouTube and type in On The Pipe Podcast, you can find our channel there. Um, it's all raw highlights. So I started off, there's a separate one for the straight rhythm event that was on Saturday. That's all raw, like head-to-head straight rhythm racing as well. Some crazy stuff in there. Billy Bolt and Manny Lettenbickler and some of them other dudes that are literally bunny hopping enduro bikes over three logs stacked on top of each other, like squatting in, preloading that thing, dumping the clutch, and literally bunny hopping. Like a log that you and I and any sane person has to like go up to, hit it with the front wheel, and then like burr up to get over it without dying. They are literally hitting it wide open on the gas, preloading the suspension, bunny hopping over it. And letting their wheel just barely tap as they get over is the craziest thing. They are literally hitting it at speed. If I tried to do that, I would do three and a half front flips, and then my bike would end up in the stands next to somebody's kid. It is insane to watch that. So you can go see those raw actions on the thing. Um, Also, Pat Samaji, 8 million time trials. Actually, I think he just won his 14th trial national championship. At the end... You see all the guys kind of, they have to turn, they go down, hit all the obstacles, turn around and come back. Everyone going down either does like a wheelie turn or leans your bike over sideways, gives it a little gas, spins it around. Passamaji goes to the end, stabs the front brake, and spins the rear end of the bike around while it's in the air after stabbing the front brake. It's like one of the most, it's like a simple thing. If you're not looking for it, you might miss it. But when you like hone in on what is going on and realize what is happening in front of you, it makes absolutely zero sense in the world. So just seeing how these riders attack this course and seeing how they gain speed by bunny hopping three logs stacked on top of each other, it's absolutely absurd. I don't understand it. Uh, I don't think I can compete. I don't think I could complete a lap at the TKO course. And they're doing it, making it look like me riding through like the finish line chicane at GNCC like as easy as you can go through the scoring section at GNCC that's how these top hard enduro guys make stuff look that like looks like you shouldn't be able to walk up it it's the craziest thing ever you have to see it with your own eyes but until you can see it with your own eyes go to our YouTube channel check it out uh, there's also a raw video of Sunday which is the final day which is all three TKO races so it's raw, it's unedited, it's exactly how I saw it. It was like you were standing in the woods, but if your eyeballs could zoom. Um, so trying to get the best coverage that we can. You can check it out. Let me know what you think about it. Um, the final race is all the way at the end, so you go through f- the both the TKO1 and TKO2 before you get into the final race. Um, so yeah, go check that out now on our YouTube channel. But we're going to go through the results real quick. Tristan Hart got it done, took the win way out in front. He was, he was pretty far out in front. He was in control of that thing the entire time. Almost had a perfect weekend uh, with all the other races, but he didn't win straight rhythm. And I think I think maybe TKO 2 someone beat him. I don't know. But uh, Tristan Hart took the win. The the raging Canadian, He he's on a tear. I mean, he I feel like he is the guy to beat right now. It seems like everything he's going to, he's winning. It's, uh, it's insane, especially watching him ride in person. So Tristan Hart... Takes the win, Factory KTM out of Canada. Uh, Billy Bolt in his bright pink boots was in the number two spot. It was cool to see the clips of Billy Bolt like doubling that stuff on the Enduro Cross track two years ago. I didn't get to see it in person, but I saw it on videos. Um, but I think he was the one that was hurt last year. He was here this year. It was awesome. Uh, cool to watch him. Manny Letton Bickler would end the day in third. So Tristan Hart takes the win, Billy Bolt second place. Manny Letton Bickler in third. Fourth place was Johnny Walker. And fifth place was Cody Webb. So, um, Cody Webb back into racing action. I know he's been dealing with some injuries and stuff as well. So, good to see him back out there grabbing a the top five. Johnny Walker. That was a really, just one little quick tangent. Being the official manufacturer of On The Pipe podcast, be it, with it being beta, uh, the beta boys... The Beta family has become my track family. Uh, super cool. And this is like, this is outside of sponsorships. This is outside of official stuff with the podcast. This is outside of the regular ad read. Um, just like a legit, legit little talk right here. They've welcomed me with open arms. They welcome everybody with those open arms. Multiple riders, non-Beta riders have said that that is probably the most fun pit to hang out at. Um, super cool guys over there. Um, and 
I don't know. So what I'm getting at is they've kind of taken me under the, their wing uh, these past couple years, especially since we've done the deal. But um, this extends way beyond that. Uh, super cool guys over there. Um, Andy, team manager. Um, yeah. So uh, Rob was there, truck driver slash chef. Kurt was there. Um, it was a good time. So we were all hanging out. Aston wasn't there, but Aston was there in spirit because he even sent – I couldn't get a bike down to TKO, so he sent his bike on the beta rig for me to ride. So I got to ride around on Aston's uh, 250RR. Thing rode like a dream. Um, although watching Hard Enduro and being on a beta two-stroke while riding the same track that all these guys are riding, maybe a little bit more confidence-inspiring than I would have liked. All of a sudden, I thought I was Johnny Walker, and I I would see some rock and be like, yeah, I could ride over that, and then I'd quickly get stuck. But anyway, um... No, it was uh, it was a good time. But because of that, um, being a part of that Beta family and being able to hang out with the Beta boys, uh, Johnny Walker was in town this year. So was Texas Tim, Apale, Apal. I don't know how you actually say it, uh, but Texas Tim. He's from Germany. He was there as well. Uh, Tim was there last year. That's where I met him at. Was at TKO last year. Last year, Danny Garza was here um, from Mexico. Also, Morgan Tanky was there uh, last year. She wasn't there this year. But um, this year, one of the riders that was there was Johnny Walker. So, Johnny Walker is one of those guys that, like, when I very first got into dirt bikes, I was watching Johnny Walker videos. Like, watching that video of him, like, in his hometown riding around and riding stuff. And watching videos of him, like, just doing gnarly hard enduro stuff and winning Erzberg and uh, the whole nine yards. And so... It was so cool to, to like be able to hang out with him and his girlfriend Emily was there with him as well. But just just talking with them, super down to earth people, uh, super cool people, super super fun people to hang out with and talk to, and then uh, ended up going to dinner with them and stuff too. So it was cool to see the star effect that Johnny brought, like the amount of fans that were standing outside of his bike and getting pictures of his bike and asking him for pictures, asking him for autographs. Like we were at dinner. And there's probably like five or six people that came over like while we were sitting at the dinner table. And he's like, I'm so sorry. Can I get a picture with you? Um, so, I don't know. It was, it was cool to be able to, to see him and see him interact with the fans. And then also, like I said, a guy that I had been watching since I've been riding dirt bikes um, over here and, and doing that. So, I don't know. It was it was just a pretty cool experience. But being able to talk with them and hanging out with them, it was uh, it was super cool as well. But also awesome to see Johnny over here and racing, uh, coming off an Enduro Cross title, uh, and then went up. He went up to Canada and raced Outliers this past weekend as well. But um, yeah, not the not the fanboy too much, but just another example of um, I don't know, just the the Beta crew in general. Um, super cool guys. Very lucky to be a part of it, and uh, very lucky that they were able to. Uh, take me in as best as as they have and then also that's aside from how sick the bikes are to ride like i said riding that 250 rr was a dream um i got my 390 back in full effect hopefully we can get some seat time in on that this week but um yeah it was a, a pretty cool experience especially like having the quote-unquote factory experience and and being able to hang out with them at the the race uh made it really cool and uh thankful for them um so then we move into this coming weekend, or excuse me, this past weekend. It was the Red Bull Outliers event up in Canada. A, eh? I may, I had, I had the thought to go up there and do that. Unfortunately, I couldn't because Mid East started back up. This was the first race from summer break at Mid East racing, and obviously I'm the announcer, so it's kind of hard to call in sick to those. So I was at Mid East, so I didn't get to watch a lot of the coverage yet for the Outliers. I plan to go back and watch it now, but I wasn't able to watch it at the time. Um, so I wish I could give you as detailed of a recap as I did TKO. Unfortunately, I wasn't there. I did see some of the social clips though, and they were like climbing a straight up and down wall. They looked like mountain goats. I don't understand it, but they did it. Um, Manny Lettenbickler ended up taking the win um, on a factory KTM as well. Billy Bolt, second once again. So two second place finishes in a row for Billy Bolt. And then Tristan Hart in third. So basically TKO results. But 
backwards for your top three. Manny took the win, Billy Bolton second, and Tristan Hart in third. Uh, Mario Roman ended up in fourth, and then Wade Young in fifth. So those are a couple of the, the world stage guys that weren't at TKO that were out there uh, racing at that one. Um, Johnny Walker, ninth place finish. Uh, Will Reardon, an eighth place finish. Um, Will put on a show last weekend at, at <laughs> Straight Rhythm. Uh, had a couple get-offs going for it, trying to get in there. Um, but, yeah, uh, Will, he got a, a win this year in the Hard Enduro Series, and uh, to see him still progressing and still going after it uh, was really cool as well. So that is the Red Bull Outliers, and now we move into the Mideast Hair Scrambles back in the domain, back in the familiar territory, back with everything that is going on in uh, the Mideast Hair Scrambles and East Coast Off-Road, right in our little nestled-up nest over here. Um so first race back from summer break, and it did not disappoint. It was a little bit dry and dusty for quad day on Saturday, but then it rained Saturday afternoon. It made the conditions perfect. Like, dirt looked awesome. Uh, looked like a really good track. Really rocky track and kind of a tight track. So perfect training for the Mountaineer, for Beckley, the GNCC that's coming up, the one to open them up from being at break. Um but the other unique thing about this property was that it is at Wellborn Farms in Boonville, North Carolina. Now, you may say, why does Boonville, North Carolina sound familiar? That is because Caleb Russell is from Boonville, North Carolina. And now that he's been up there, Johnny Girard is in Boonville, North Carolina. Lane Michael is in Boonville, North Carolina. Uh, Craig DeLong, Ryder Lafferty, um, Cole Forbes, uh a lot of these guys, everyone that's training at Ranch Russell and training with Caleb is in Boonville, North Carolina. Ranch Russell is in Boonville, North Carolina. And actually, the property that we were racing at is on, like, Caleb's house borders the property. Um, Wellborn Farms, his wife was Wellborn. A lot of the workers from Mideast are Wellborns. Um, Caleb's son was able to race as well. Caleb, or Crew Russell, Caleb's son. His great grandfather is the landowner of Wellborn Farms. Uh, also, the the group that works for us, uh, Garrett Wellborn, Sweep Rider, and Anna Wellborn helps out as well. They have a son, Maddox Wellborn, who is also the great grandson of the landowner. And then the Crew and Maddox were both on the youth or the Pee Wee overall podium together, which was pretty cool, being that it's family property, family land. Anyway, I digress. What I'm getting at is with it being the local track. For all these guys, it turned out to the most stacked local pro lineup that I've ever seen in my life. I There can't be any other local series that had a pro row like we had at the Mideast Hair Scrambles this past weekend. There were 16 riders on the pro row. And it's not like just any random 16 pro riders. I'm going to read through the results. We're going to go through uh, the entire standings real quick. Johnny Girard. Took the win. So it was Johnny Girard, Lane Michael in second, Trevor Bollinger in third, Ben Kelly in fourth, Lennon Snodgrass in fifth, Jonathan Johnson in sixth, Brody Johnson in seventh, Michael DeLosa in eighth, Will Steven Piper in ninth, Nick DeFeo in tenth, Chase Landers in eleventh, Zach Davidson in twelfth, Cade Henderson in thirteenth, Mitchell OMB in fourteenth, and Colton Shields will round out the pro class. That is the list of people that were at this thing. The top one, two, three, four, five, six. The top six guys are factory guys. The next few guys are satellite guys. It's crazy. It was a stacked pro row. It was an awesome race. It was awesome to see. But it's also the, the familiar territory because the Ranch Russell guys, the KTM group guys, are training there full time. Uh, Craig did not race it, obviously. Oh, for obvious reasons, he is currently tied for the points lead for the overall for the GNCC series. So I think that was more of a, hey, you know what? Let's uh, let's focus our efforts over here on that. So Craig did not race, but he he trains and rides with these boys as well. Um, but that's what I was wondering too. It's like familiar territory, but the the trails are different. So are they going to do even better because they know the place, or is it going to be a little bit? more difficult possibly because they're riding trails that they know they ride those trails all the time well the race trails are different from their training trails so you jump on a trail that you know and that you ride every day and you think you know where it's going say 
you know, once you go past that little rock garden and go in between those two trees, you know the track, the training loop turns right. Well, maybe the Mideast track turned left. So they could be going in it with a preconceived notion, thinking that they know the trail and end up finding out that they don't. And I feel like that's even harder than, uh, like, not knowing where the trail was going. So, I don't know. It was cool. Lane Michael got the worst start. He was dead last going into the woods. I don't know what happened. Didn't see what happened. I was looking at the front guys to call the whole shot. But then I looked back. Lane Michael, dead last. Because we were all kind of talking amongst ourselves, like, who we predicted to win. And Lane Michael was a pretty popular choice. And uh, that's when he was dead last. I was like, oh, man, this would have been a great day for Lane. Well, then they come back around after the first lap, and Lane Michael is in the overall lead. I was like, how in the world did he just pass those 15 guys and go from last to first on the first lap? And then Johnny Gerrard was hot on his tail. And then they were like, on that first lap, they were already checked out. Not checked out, but like, put it this way. There's a long straightaway coming into the scoring section. And then you go back around a couple turns and down and jump a creek jump up a hill and back into the woods. They were already in and out of scoring and off into the woods before third place came around. I think at that time it was Ben Kelly um, after the first lap. So those two boys were pushing it. And then uh, a couple laps in, I saw Lane's dad, and I was like, oh, he's riding good. And he said, oh, I think he lost brakes. And I said, front or back? He said, I don't know. He just yelled at me that he lost his brakes. So then I started watching Lane every time he came in, and he he would kind of mess up the little turn coming out of scoring, like not really square it upright and kind of bobble a little bit. And I looked, and his back foot would stay on the peg. So he wasn't even reaching for the back brakes. He was keeping his feet on the peg. So I was like, oh, well, he must have lost his rear brakes. Well, those two riders still continue to battle, Lane and, and Johnny. They stayed together the entire time. Um, Lane made a couple passes, like was back in front of him, and then Johnny was back in front, and then Lane was back in front. So they did a lot of swapping, and they, they did a lot of battling and um, really put themselves out in front of this thing. I think they were like two and a half minutes ahead of third place, even at the end of the race. So they were both riding good, Lane doing it with no brakes, Johnny doing it um, – out there and they're just battling back and forth it was an awesome battle to watch and then uh another thing like there's battles throughout the entire thing so third place was a battle between trevor bollinger and ben kelly um trevor as he mentioned on the podium has only ridden the bike just a handful of times dealing with injuries trying to heal up and come back um ben kelly we all know the injuries that he's been through um over the past year or so and uh with the broken leg with the shoulder that kind of stuff uh lyndon snodgrass has been off the bike all year long battling an illness he just got back on the bike not that long ago so for him to come back and get a top five finish against those guys uh he was riding really good jonathan johnson and brody johnson they were all in the mix as well all four of those guys ben Lyndon, johnny brody they were all battling with each other and then you kind of had that other group that were all tight and battling with each other too um with mike delosa and will steven piper they were all over each other uh nick defeo chase landers it was chase race or chase landers for first race back um so it was cool to watch all those battles develop uh throughout the day also um one of the things that we've kind of gathered through social media is trevor bollinger was a ranch russell guy trevor bollinger was on the show we kind of talked through his whole career earlier in the year and he talked about training at ranch russell he talked about that kind of stuff well now he's back with his old trainer the guy that he mentioned in our podcast together Tomas, and so he's got a group, the Johnson boys, uh, Mike DeLosa and Trevor, they're all training together up at Trevor's place with Tomas, who came back up from South America to, to help them boys train. And so then it was kind of a, a weird position for him that I would imagine, and this is just my interpretation of the situation, um, so it could be completely wrong. But that was one of the things that I was thinking. It's like, hey, you've been training at Ranch Russell and then decided to go do your own thing, and now you're coming back to the training grounds of Ranch Russell against the train or against the Ranch Russell crew. And albeit Trevor has not been on the bike, as he said, on the podium. And so for him to come back and uh, walk into that situation and have a good ride, third place on the day, I was absolutely stoked to see that. Hopefully uh, get some confidence under him, and uh, we'll see him back at the races as well. But – uh, yeah, just one of those storylines I saw leading into it. Also, Lyndon. Um, Lyndon, I teased a little bit ago that we are going to do some video stuff with him. Uh, we are still in talks with it. I think it's just one of those things where, like, Lyndon has been off the bike, and I chatted with him a good bit after the race. Um, in these situations, like, I'm the media guy. And so, got to do some diving, got to do some digging. But some of these guys, like, 
I think of all these the 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 guys as buddies. Um, buddies of mine. I'm I like them all. Um, hang out with them all. Talk to them all. But some of the guys are like good friends of mine. And so when it comes down to situations like that, where I I know more just on a friend level than, um, what am I trying to say? There's a difference between getting information for the show and then genuinely caring about a person. And when it comes to those, and I'm like checking on on buddies as friends, I, it's not my place to come and regurgitate that information. So uh, I was able to talk to Lyndon a good bit, and like I said, he's the reigning defending XC2 champion. Obviously, unfortunately, wasn't able to defend that this year um, due to some health complications. I think he's mostly kept that under wraps. Um, him and I have talked about doing a video about it and even doing a podcast about it when we do the video. Uh, just to kind of explain what it is that he went through, what it is that he's still going through, and now that he's back on the bike, what he has to continue to go through to get back to that level. Um, and this was his longest time back on a bike this year, racing for two hours, and he still ended up with a fifth place. And um, talked with him a little bit, and he's still getting better, but it's got to be frustrating to not ride at that point that you know that you're capable of. And um, so – Hoping that we can get Lyndon's story across here soon and uh, let him tell it from his own perspective and then also see that continue to get better um, as he comes back and transitions into the XC1 class. That is one of the teasers we threw out before about riders stepping up and, and changing different classes. Lyndon Snodgrass is officially an XC1 rider. Um, I do believe that he continues or he plans to continue out this season in the XC1 class. Uh, based off the red number plates he's been riding in all of his videos. And I think we have seen Lyndon Snodgrass in XC2 for the last time. I think he will be XC1 the rest of this year and then move into the XC1 class for the entirety of next season. Um, there's also some other guys moving up to XC1. Excited to talk about that as more information opens up about it. But, um, yeah, that was basically what happened at the Mideast. Um, I do want to give a shout-out to Ethan Harwell. I don't know if Ethan Harwell or Scott Harwell or any of the Harwell family listens to the podcast or listens to OTP. Um, Scott Harwell, super good guy. Today's his birthday. Happy birthday, Scott. Um, might have been yesterday. My yesterday and today have blended together with how busy I've been, all these meetings going on, how we're up to something. The days blend together. Yesterday and today was Scott Harwell's birthday. Scott Harwell is a truck driver for the KTM group. He drives the KTM Semi that has like all the the KTM minis in it from my understanding. Like when you see the the Junior Supercross like the kids on 50 50s at Supercross, I think he drives that rig. And he might do stuff beyond that, I'm not sure. But Ethan Harwell has been setting the town ablaze at the Mid-East Hair Scrambles this year. Um, winning youth overalls from the second row. He's still racing the, the second row, not the front row. And winning races, competing for races. Jonathan Snyder um, is a force to be reckoned with in those morning races as well. So Ethan and Jonathan tend to battle pretty hard in those morning races at the Mid-East Hair Scrambles for the overall wins. Well, Ethan Harwell goes out. Gets into the physical overall lead. Wins the physical overall lead. So, obviously, on time adjusted, he also wins, starting from the second row. Wins the youth overall. And then decides every other weekend he races the pro race. So, it's the youth race. And then there's the 10 a.m. amateur race. And then there's the pro race in the afternoon. Usually, he takes some time to settle up or to settle down, cool off, get fluids in him. So, sits out the amateur race and then races the pro race in um, the schoolboy class. Well, this weekend, there TJ Brown is another rider. He's racing four strokes. He lights. He just turned 14 years old this year. Big boy for 14 years old. Um, but he had to get off of mini bikes. But because he was 13 years old coming into the season and his first year on big bikes, he's racing four strokes. He lights. He has been unbeaten on the season. Came into the weekend 10 and 0. Perfect record. Won every race so far this year. Trying to keep that streak alive. Ethan Harwell. I think wanted the challenge, wanted to, to go up against it, and uh, wanted to be the one to end the, the win streak. I can only imagine. Um, but so he races the same class, and those two get out in front. I think by halfway point in the race, they were six minutes ahead of third place. 
It was insane. They were both battling. Ethan Harwell was leading that race. So Ethan Harwell wins the youth overall, goes straight back down to the start, goes up to the podium, talks to me on the podium, goes back down to the starting line, races the 10 a.m. or the, I think it's 11 a.m. there, uh, amateur race, almost wins that thing, which nobody in the history is overall the youth race and the amateur race. And um, so an hour youth race, a two-hour amateur race, um, ended up, those two ended up getting together. Turned out to be a big ordeal. I'm not going to get into that. But that's how that race happened. They were battling for the lead way out in front. So Ethan goes from overall in the youth race to right in the mix of overall in the amateur race. Well, then he only has to do one lap to get his points for his schoolboy class in the pro race to wrap up the championship. So he goes out and races that one and doesn't do one lap. He goes out and wins his class again. So five hours of racing, an hour in the youth race, two hours in the amateur race, and straight back into two hours in the pro race. Absolutely absurd. Don't know how in the world he does it or did it, whatever. And uh, I don't know, just a pretty impressive feat uh, that I thought of or that, I thought was an impressive feat. So shout out Ethan Harwell, the Iron Man of the weekend. But that being said, that about wraps everything up for this week's episode of On the Pipe Podcast. Rest assured, we're back in your life. We're back in business. We're back on our normal schedule. Um, minimum of Tuesdays. As soon as, like this weekend, I'm not going to commit to anything because this weekend is Labor Day weekend. Uh, there's no races going on that I am aware of. And, oh, well, there's one. Um, crap, there is one. I don't know. Next week is up in the air. Might do Monday and Tuesday. We'll definitely do a show on Tuesday. And then after that, once we get back into to real racing, we should be right back on track. Monday recaps. Tuesday, we need to get some guests on. I don't think I've had guests on since Craig DeLong in March, other than the people that have been in studio with us. So, Need to get back on that routine. Need to keep bringing you the best coverage in off-road racing, especially given the fact that we're up to something. And this is about to... You're going to like this one. It's going to be pretty crazy. I'm pretty excited about it. Pretty happy about it. Um, so anyway, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us for On The Pipe Podcast. We will catch you next time.